All right, here we are back in Philippians chapter 2. We're going to be starting about verse 20 today. Um, some of my favorite parts of the New Testament letters are the personal communications that go along with all the fine teaching and the practical exhortations. And I'm, I am really glad that the New Testament is mostly letters and not essays, because you should never separate theology from life. And the Bible just doesn't do that. That's why Paul has a uh, fairly common pattern in his letters. Usually it's first doctrine and then application, truth first and practice. Ephesians is one of the few letters of his that is not personal. It doesn't have any personal greetings or anything, or it's not written to any individuals. It's written to a church. So, um, but that's a classic example of truth and then practice. So, like, here's what to believe and here's how you should live with that. And Ephesians has just as much how to live as it does what to believe portions. So even the greatest theology book of the Bible, Paul's letter to the Romans, after 11 chapters of pure doctrine on the way, uh, way we're saved, the doctrine of salvation, and then God's relationship to Israel, after 11 chapters of theology, he still has five extremely helpful chapters and personal greetings after that. So he's always including that. Theology is not just for the mind, it's for life. Now, Philippians is a much more personal letter and doesn't follow the typical pattern of Paul of first doctrine, then practice. But that's great because theology in this letter is woven all through um, the, the personal part of the letter. And in today's text, we want to get to see more close up uh, two, I guess, lesser known saints is the way to put it, uh, men that served Christ and helped lay the foundation for the Christian faith. These men were not apostles um, or men of great standing. Uh, I don't know of any statues to them that have been erected. There might be some somewhere, but they made um, no known contributions to theology that we know of. But without men like them, the church would never have gotten off the ground. And without men like them today, the church could not thrive and survive. Christianity would have stalled out and died without Timothy's and Titus's. So it's the regular folks who love Christ and make sacrifices for him that are really the hidden story of God's redemptive work in the world. And that will always be the case until we stand before Jesus and the rewards are given by him along with words of commendation. Well done, good and faithful servant. The work of people that are not remembered will be remembered by him and he will honor them. So in Philippians 2, basically 19 through 30, Paul is just doing ministry by discussing communications and travel with a supporting church. But in doing that, he says a lot about these two men, Timothy and Epaphroditus, great men of God, but lesser known. So these, these are men that average people can relate to. Um, early in chapter 2, you know, Paul presented Jesus as our great example of humility, and he is very much that, for no one has ever come from such heights to such lowliness by choice. Jesus did that voluntarily, and it's the incredible truth about our salvation that God became human, and not just human, but a poor human, a lowly working class human who gave his life for us and died a horrible death on our behalf. He is our perfect example, but it's also helpful to have examples of people who are not the Son of God, I think sometimes we just say, well, that's Jesus, right? But he was a true man. But, um, but these are sinful men like us. So um, what, what they were able to do and how they served him is a great example for us. They're more like us. Regular people who labored for Christ when the whole great work of spreading God's redemptive love throughout the world uh, was first happening. So it was not all done by apostles. Uh, we often call them um, 12 men who changed the world, but they could not have done it without many Timothys and Epaphroditei. Is that the right plural for Epaphroditus? I don't know. But um, these men are wonderful role models for us. Warren Wearsby, the famous preacher, he called them the priceless pair here in Philippians chapter 2. So let me just review our setting. Paul is uh, in Rome, he's under house arrest, awaiting a decision by the emperor about whether he would be executed or set free. Um, two pretty stark choices there. As is often the case, Timothy is with him. 
Now, Epaphroditus brought a gift of funds to Paul. That's why he's in a rented house, not in a jail or a prison somewhere or a dungeon. Uh, he came from Philippi to bring Paul mon money. And Philippi is Epaphroditus' home church. That's where he's from. So w while in Rome, he got really sick, but eventually he got better. Now, now that he's all well, Epaphroditus is going to take this letter that Paul's writing, the letter of Philippians, and he's going to take it back home to Philippi. So that's what's going on. So this part of the letter is about the nitty-gritty of church planting in the first century, which involved travel and hardship and persecution, but it's mainly about ministry and loving concern for the spiritual well-being of God's people, for the church. So that's what I want you to capture from this, the spirit of these men and how they lived in their church community, because they are models for us in doing that. So as we look at this... Um, Epaphroditus will soon be in Philippi with the letter, and Paul is telling them that he very much wants to send Timothy to them as well. Many of them know Timothy. He helped plant that church with the Apostle Paul at the, at the very beginning. That was the first church in Europe, so um, it's like a big deal, and Timothy was a part of that beginning there. So the older members of the congregation, or those that had been there from the beginning, would have known Timothy there um, from the very beginning of the church. So Paul um, sending his men out for visits was standard procedure. As an intrepid church planter in new areas, he sometimes revisited the churches he started, but he couldn't always do that because he was always sort of looking for the next horizon of unreached people. So he would send his men back to visit the churches that he had planted to make sure they were doing okay. And of course, in later years, Paul was in custody um, for several years, so he uh, would communicate with them from prison and send guys in and out and all around from there. So he starts here with Timothy, um, verse 19. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I may also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. So Paul wants to know how they are doing. And he uses very positive language, assuming he's going to be encouraged, he's going to be heartened by what he hears, but he will send Timothy to make sure that they are successful at following the counsel and encouragement he's giving them in the letter to the Philippians. Now, the next verses are uh, take a different tone. They're, they're kind of painful to read, actually. Verse 20, he says, For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. So you see the Timothys of the world are very special people, even among believers. They have the mindset of doing things for Jesus. They live for Jesus. Paul says he has no one else of kindred spirit. I think the New American Standard Bible, which I'm using, translates that very well. We don't really have an English word that matches this Greek word that Paul uses, or maybe he coined he says, equal soul. Nobody is of equal soul. Um, in other words, someone who has the same level of interest that he has in the welfare of the Philippians. No one else, he says. Now, we know Paul did have some disciples of his, uh, some people on his team that did not turn out very well. Some actually abandoned him. Some are named in the New Testament. We don't know the details of their failure, but the life of a church planter obviously would be very difficult and dangerous. You had to be all in. We don't know if they left for sinful reasons or if they just gave up and couldn't go on anymore. But a few years after this, Paul would write about Demas, one of his team, with these words, Demas, having loved the present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. So it's kind of a similar comment to what we're seeing here in verse 21. Um, he's talking here in Philippians about people who seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. And the example of Demas we have from the New Testament is that he loved this present world. It's sort of a similar idea. I don't know what was happening in Thessalonica, but he wanted to be there. He had other things that he preferred. I guess that's the easiest way to say it. Well, that's not Timothy. And we shouldn't think that was most of Paul's team either. He had equally good men, Luke, Aristarchus, Titus. There was a whole bunch of guys that were faithful. So when he says, I had no one else, I'm sure he's saying, I have no one else with me in Rome from his team. He might have had eight or ten guys that he was sending around, but only Timothy was there with him in Rome. So where would he look for help? You know, well, he would look 
to the Roman church. Uh, that was the community of Christians that was there where he was. So I think in verse 21, he's probably referring to them. Um, we already know that there were those who regarded themselves, their position, their influence, and notoriety more than they actually desired serving God. Paul has seen that. Remember in chapter 1, um, he said, Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ for, even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. So there were some that were preaching Christ in Rome from goodwill, but there were others, and um, it sounds like there was quite a few of them that um, really were kind of in it for themselves. Now, that preachers are never like that, are they? Okay, sometimes. <laughs> but there was a problem with preachers being more into themselves than into the great task. So, in verse 21, Paul suggests uh, here that um, he must have asked them for help, uh, maybe with sending someone to Philippi, but he got excuses instead of volunteers. So there was really only Timothy, his, his right arm, who he probably really wanted with him, uh, since he was under arrest and couldn't leave the house, um, to go. He probably wanted to keep him, but he's going to let Timothy go because Paul is willing to let um, interests of this world go and personal interests go for the good of other people. And the Philippians' health as a church body is more important than him having Timothy with him. And I'm pretty sure Paul must have accurately diagnosed the unwillingness of others around him as self-interest. And that means we should ask ourselves... If I was in the church at Rome, just living my Christian life, and Paul asked me to go to Philippi, would I have gone? I don't know if I would. I don't know if I would have. To me, to me, it's a really big deal going to Africa, and it only takes two days to get there. And, I, and then you spend a, a little time there, and then it takes two days to get back. Not very much of an inconvenience. Philippi is 800 miles away from Rome. No jets. No planes. You had to walk or ride, and um, it, it would take probably six weeks, maybe longer, to get to Philippi. And then you spend time there, and then you come home. Probably most people aren't up for that, right? Philippi was a faraway place. So Paul ascribes here the lack of candidates to these believers pursuing their own interests instead of Christ. Your average Roman Christian would have had the kind of obligations that we all have, work, family, uh, other things going on, Friday night chariot races at the Hippodrome, which you just can't miss, things like that. So they had no relationship either with the, the uh, Philippi Bible Church because they'd never been there. Um, you know, Paul had planted that church. Timothy had planted that church. They didn't know them personally. Um, and they really only had a short acquaintance with Paul. He didn't plant the church in Rome either, and he's been under arrest the whole time. So while people visited him and got to know him, he wasn't part of their assemblies every Sunday. And so there's just a pretty obvious natural human reasons why people would say, "Yeah, you know, I'd love to help, but uh, got a lot of things going on. So all of that's happening there. So it's not really surprising that the local Christians would not have the same soul, that kindred spirit that Paul had uh, regarding the church at Philippi. That's just human nature. But that makes it all the more something to be wary of in ourselves. If there's work to be done for the Lord, uh, are we going to step up and do it? Or are we just going to, eh, you know, I don't think so. Now, that kind of thing. Uh, we aren't told who these people are, but um, they are believers that Paul is in interacting with in some way. And they're just not going to help. There's nobody else of kindred spirit that's willing to go and make sacrifices for the church in Philippi. So Paul says they have their own interests. Well, we all have our own interests, don't we? So, but you see, the problem is their interests are prioritized so that they take the place of the interests of Christ. That's what Paul is pointing at here. So this gives us cause for self-examination, and that's something I think the text should teach us. What are our actual priorities? If Jesus has an interest that conflicts with your interests, how do you process that? How do you think that through? How do you pray about that? I'm sure you've heard the old cliche that in churches, 10% of people do 90% of the work. I don't think that's true in our church because I know at least 23% of the people do the work. No, there's, it's more than that. We have a really active and wonderful congregation where people help. And we don't want to overburden people. We want to spread out the work so people don't have to kill themselves serving the church, that they can do it faithfully and with joy, and others are all helping. And we have a pretty good 
I think, better than most in that kind of a situation. More than 23%. Just that was a joke. Does that mean that you have to be one of the 10% that's doing 90% of the work? Well, how about just not thinking about it that way? Because I think it would be very burdensome to think, I've got to be one of the 10% that does 90% of the work. Don't even think about that. Instead, just if there's a ministry need that becomes known, maybe we could just evaluate the situation and just honestly seek the Lord and ask him if they, he wants us to help with that particular thing. You know, people say, let me pray about that. Well, if you really pray about that, I think that's all they really have to do and let the Lord lead you one way or the other. But I think sometimes people say, let me pray about that and they just don't want to do it. And they don't really intend to pray about that. But you really should pray on it if you say, I'm going to pray on it. And your life should reflect Jesus and his interests as a priority for you. I'm not trying to guilt you into service uh, because what kind of a service would it be if you did it out of guilt anyway, right? I am hoping all believers will just light a fire in themselves to serve Christ when they see the example of Timothy and Epaphroditus. Scripture tells us we all have a gift from the Holy Spirit, and it specifically says that gift is to be used in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 7, to each one is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. That common good part, don't forget that. Gifts of the Spirit are not given for us, for ourselves. They are given to us to serve other people in the body of Christ. So you can't say, I have nothing to offer if you're a believer. The Spirit of God gave you something to offer. Don't forget that. So we're just talking about using gifts that you've been given, not whether you have them or not. You've got something. The Spirit gave you something. Some people will say, you know, I'm just shy. Guess what? Timothy. Timothy was shy. He was a shy person. It's very clear in the Bible that Timothy, who's mentioned about 25 times, is unsure of himself. He lacks confidence as a leader. It's easy for him to withdraw. That's just his personality. He's timid, timid Timothy. They probably called him that. Well, they probably didn't know the word timid, huh? He's not a bold person. He's a timid person, but he's, he's just the kind of guy that's not inclined to push or to give orders, or direct other people's behavior. But sometimes he has to because he has this really important job of ministering to these churches and helping disciple them and grow them. So we have several examples in, in the Bible of Paul actually encouraging him and exhorting him to action. So if you're shy, you can take these texts and kind of apply them to yourself a little bit. Uh, Paul just wants him to be a little more authoritative in terms of uh, his duties to the church as a shepherd. 1 Timothy 4.12 Remember, Paul wrote two letters to Timothy. 1 Timothy 4.12, Let no one look down on your youthfulness. And then he says, Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through the prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. So he's reminding him of his commission, his ordination when all the elders laid hands on him and commissioned him for the ministry. He says, we all saw your giftedness, so don't shirk it and don't hide it. Step out there. Step up. Don't be intimidated. We know you're kind of on the younger side, but uh, that you've got the authority and you've got the gift. So uh, you've been assigned. I've sent you to this place or that place. So you serve that church with, with uh, courage and step out there and do it. It doesn't matter what your personality is. Just do the work. Just do the work. That personality can actually be a good thing and a humbleness that would characterize that kind of leadership. But the leadership has to happen, Timothy. So get out there and do that. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, Paul tells him, kindle afresh. That's like stirring up the embers in a fire, you know. Get that, get that thing going. Kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. See, Paul was part of that group of elders that laid hands on Timothy. God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Why would he say that to Timothy? Because he does sort of have a spirit of timidity. That's kind of where he is. So power and love and discipline, those things are not dependent on having a kind of an aggressive A personality. That can be expressed by a shy person. 
power and love and discipline. It, it's just a, it doesn't have anything to do with what kind of a person your personality is. It has everything to do with the commitment you have to serve Jesus in the way he wants you to do it. So I think the sweetest example in the New Testament of this is 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 10, which is not written to Timothy, but to the church in Corinth where Paul is sending Timothy. So that's another situation where he's sending him somewhere to kind of make sure everything's okay and oversee and give counsel and advice. And he says, now, if Timothy comes, see that he is, see that he is with you without cause to be afraid. <laughs> I love it, for he is doing the Lord's work, and so am I. Listen, don't scare my young man, Timothy, please. That's what he has to tell them that in a letter, because Timothy is easily scared. He's intimidated easily, so he's saying, don't do that. So you know what? It's okay to be shy, but serve Jesus. You don't have to be anybody but you, but serve Jesus. That's all that matters. So it's not personality that makes Timothy useful. It's his heart. It's what's in his heart. Verse 20, he is genuinely concerned for your welfare. That's what matters. His priority is Christ. His passion is the welfare of the churches. So that's what you want in a church leader. That's what you want in anyone who serves in any kind of ministry capacity in the church, from the highest to the lowest place. People who can set self aside who aren't all about their own interests they just love and they have a genuine concern for the spiritual well-being of other people and here's what else made timothy useful he's reliable timid yeah he was timid but faithful and dependable too so you add that on to a man who's genuinely concerned about the welfare of other believers and you've got a winner you've got a guy to model your life after. In verse 22, Paul says, but you know of his proven worth, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Proven worth. That proven character is what made Paul invite Timothy onto his ministry team originally. Timothy's first mentioned in the history, church history book of the New Testament, which is the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 16, verse 1, let me read that for you. This is where Paul picks Timothy up, if you will. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. Lystra, that's Timothy's hometown. And a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. And he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted this man to go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Okay, allowing yourself to be circumcised as an adult, that shows commitment. Ouch. But the fact that before Paul could even guide or mentor Timothy as part of his team, he was already a solid and dependable Christian man. That tells us a lot. He was well spoken of, not only by his hometown people, but by a nearby town, the people in Iconium. So Lystra and Iconium. He was already maturing Um, functioning for Jesus, well-respected, highly regarded. And so once Paul starts working with him, he actually became like a son to Paul. He was probably about the age that um, a son of Paul would have been. So they were knit together like a dad bringing up his son in the family business, right? Only this business um, wasn't being a carpenter or a tanner or something like that. It was selfless service to the church for Jesus' sake. And Timothy was a proven man in that department. So Paul tells the Philippians, I'm sending you Timothy as soon as my case is settled. And he may follow himself soon after. So verse 23, therefore, I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I myself also will be coming shortly. Um, His life could have ended up ending shortly, but he's hoping that he's going to end up with them shortly. So, okay, now let's talk about this other man of quality from Philippi, the man that brought Paul this gift of support, and that's Epaphroditus. This is a man that Paul loves and has a lot of respect for. And you can look at this threefold appellation he gives him, these uh, sort of descriptions of him. Verse 25, I thought it was necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother 
and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier. Those three terms together really express the admiration that Paul had for Epaphroditus and the bond they shared in Christ and in the work that they did together. Brother, of course, the Greek word Adelphon, that's for, you know, our the most Greek named city in the United States I know of is Philadelphia. Adelphos is brother, and they call it the city of brotherly love. Phila is the idea of liking or loving something, so um, brotherly love. So he says Adelphon. Then the other two words begin with this little Greek prefix we talked about a couple weeks ago, uh, soon. Uh, Our word S-Y-N comes from that, like synergy and things like that. In Greek, it always means with or together. And when you add it on the front of a word, it's sort of like co or or with. Or uh, in this case, Paul uses my translation, it says fellow. So ergon is the word for worker. And he uses the word sunergon, which means co-worker, co-laborer, or fellow worker is the way the New American Standard translates it. And then stratios is the Greek word for soldier, and this is a sustratiotes, is, is, is the word Paul uses. So fellow soldier, a comrade in arms is sort of the idea. These all have special ideas associated with them. Brother speaks to the familial bond that we have in Christ. We have one father, and we are all siblings in the Lord. Fellow worker tells us that this is more than relational. He's not just a brother. He's a fellow worker. We work side by side in the Lord's vineyard together. And fellow soldier is very fitting because Paul often sees the work of the ministry as as spiritual warfare. Not war against people, but he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations, and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete, he says. So our war is against spiritual deception. So we take captive ideas raised up against the knowledge of the true God. And the fortresses we destroy are ideas or worldviews or systems of spiritual bondage or sin, those kinds of things. Um, William Hendrickson, the commentator, has a good description of battles that these men faced uh, throughout their ministry in the Roman Empire. He says, a worker must needs be a warrior. For in the work of the gospel, one encounters many foes Judaistic teachers, we're actually going to see them in chapter 3, Greek and Roman mockers, emperor worshipers, sensualists, the world rulers of darkness, etc. Accordingly, on the part of every worker, there must be a prodigious exertion of energy against the foe and unquestioning obedience to the captain. Jesus is the captain. In the full assurance of ultimate victory. That's exactly right. So, yeah, Epaphroditus was a soldier in that fight and more, brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier. He was all of these things. And that's what believers in ministry should be to each other. Family, sharing the workload, comrades in arms. I don't think there's any more binding quality between men than being in war together. I mean, there's something about danger that uh, when people have to depend each other for their lives, that builds a bond that lasts forever. But um, And that's kind of what he's talking about here, that same kind of deep connection through the Lord's work, fighting these um, foes together, these spiritual foes together. So there's other aspects of church planting ministry that are soldier-like. It's a singular focus on the job. A good soldier puts other things aside. In fact, when Paul wrote Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, he said, Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Good soldiers are committed. They also take risks. And just being closely associated with Paul, um, you know, if you're hanging around with a guy that might be executed by the emperor and he's like under arrest right now and you're visiting him every day, that's risky. 
because what if that goes against him? Um, well, you're his buddy. What are you, are you part of this outfit too? Who are you? And that could be extremely risky. More generally speaking, church planting in the pagan Greco-Roman world was just a hard life. Um, the first century mission field was very dangerous. Travel in those days was inherently dangerous, but there were also along the roads, thieves and brigands, uh, wherever you traveled and you're away from your community. So if you got sick, uh, which is exactly what happened to Epaphroditus, who's going to take care of you if you're on the road, right? So verse 25, he says, I thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, my fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need, verse 26, because he was longing for you all and was distressed. Epaphroditus was kind of upset. Why? Because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed, he was sick to the point of death. But God had mercy on him and not in, on him only, but also on me so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. It just would have crushed Paul's spirit if Epaphroditus had died, but he didn't. God was merciful to him. So church planting in the first century and in many countries today in our time is like being a soldier because it requires focused de dedication and it involves some pretty serious risk. We're seeing that in Iran and China, um, all kinds of countries today where you're just flat out risking your health, your safety, your life sometimes, and certainly your freedom to work for Jesus. And it was that way then as well. You can really see um, the heart of Epaphroditus and his concern of them being worried about him. Remember how long it takes to get messages back and forth? They wouldn't have known for many, many weeks if he was okay or not. They just would have heard that he was very, very sick. And he's worried about that. It upsets him that they're even concerned. Um, if you look at verse 27, does anything surprise you about that verse? Why was he sick? I mean, aren't we supposed to claim our healing? Isn't physical healing guaranteed in the atonement of Jesus? I mean, that's what the TV preachers tell us all the time. Why was he sick? And, and, and uh, here's Paul. I mean, you get a really strong sense that Paul was like concerned that Epaphroditus wasn't going to make it. I mean, his life was hanging by a thread. This tells us some things, that Paul's apostolic power to heal was not absolute, or perhaps by this time in his ministry, which was after many years of labor, um, maybe the miracle became less and less important as the gospel seed was planted around. Maybe the gifts started to fade. It was certainly not a guarantee or a cure-all or something to claim and expect in every circumstance at this point in ministry. He was afraid he was going to die. So he didn't know that he was just going to be better. You might remember that when Timothy was having tummy trouble, Paul wrote him, this is 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23, Paul, Paul wrote him and said, No longer drink water exclusively, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Timothy was sickly. Frequent ailments. Man, where's the healing power? Where's the healing ministry? Why doesn't Timothy go see a healer? He just was sick. And that doesn't always work that way. Not all prayers are answered. Paul himself had a thorn in the flesh, remember. So Epaphroditus was sick unto death, but God had mercy on him. God helped him get better. Miracle crusades and power encounters, which are so in vogue today, uh, were not part of normal New Testament Christianity. People got sick, and some of them died. Miracles were special to point to the apostles. That was their purpose of miracles. They were Christ's special representatives, and he gave them these certain remarkable powers. And, um, but people still got sick and even had frequent ailments. And sometimes they died. So in the case of Epaphroditus, God was merciful and he recovered. And here's where the word joy comes in. Remember, Philippians is the book of joy. You always find joy words in there somewhere, each section. So Paul is... Um, excited to think about the Philippians seeing Epaphroditus again themselves. When they get the letter, he's going to be there because he's bringing the letter. So verse 28, therefore I have sent him all the more eagerly so that when you see him again, you may rejoice and be less concerned and I may be less concerned about you. 
So they'll be happy to see him. Paul will be happy that they got this letter correcting them. And he'll be happy. And he holds Epaphroditus up before them as a model, a true model, a man to be esteemed. Verse 29, receive him then in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. His uh, risking death was probably the illness, but some commentators believe that was a persecution incident that may have happened with regard to him as well. So, but, but by the end of verse 30 there, speaking of deficiency of their service, um, that just means by being with Paul, Epaphroditus could do more than the Philippians could from far away. They could send money, but Epaphroditus could be there and minister to Paul's needs and do other tasks for him and all of that. So he's not saying you guys are deficient. He's just saying he was able to do a lot more than you are able to do. So they had sent him. This is what Paul is saying. You've sent me a very fine man and you need to esteem him, highly regard him. I've, he's been really useful and done so much for me. So hold him in high regard, Paul says. So here we have two very fine men, not supermen, faithful men. That's what they are. Men not sidetracked by the world, men that have courage, men willing to risk suffering, men who can finish a task and see it out to the end. We should look to them as role models in terms of ministry, church work, serving Christ, don't assume any kind of perfection in them. They weren't perfect. They were just good models. We don't worship them. We just learn from them. But recognize their fine qualities and try to cultivate similar virtues in your own spiritual life. You should be the kind of a church person that other church people would say, brother or sister, fellow worker, soldier in arms, comrade, <laughs> comrade, as the Germans would say, um, brothers in arms. So we're talking about really their heart, aren't we? Their heart for God, the, how they prioritize the Lord Jesus and his work. It's not personality. It's not natural giftedness. Those things are great, but uh, it's not that. It's not that at all. What kind of heart do they have? And how can I have a heart like that too? That's the question you want to ask. Okay, that's what we want to pursue. Next week, we're going to look at a scripture that is on more fences and gates across America than any other text in the entire Bible. Beware of the dogs. So come back for that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the faithful brothers and sisters that do your work just for you, who are so overwhelmed by your goodness they want to serve. And other things just start to fade. Help us all to grow as brothers and sisters, as co-laborers in your vineyard, as comrades in arms against all spiritual darkness. We ask this in Jesus' name.